Okay, uh, it's uh, six o'clock, so maybe yes. time to start. Hi, good evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to inform you that the Spring 2021 Guest Lecture Series is uh, supported by the Brain Korea 21, Step 4 Educational Research Group of the Department of Global Public Administration at Yonsei University Media Campus. Tonight, we have a very eminent scholar who is Professor Wolfgang Drexler in the Ragnar Nexi Department of Innovation and Governance at the Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia. He is currently the chairman of the European Association for Public Administration Accreditation, the so-called EAPA, and he is also honorary professor of the University of College London and associate at Harvard University's Davis Center. His lecture topic is Max Weber and global public administration. As we know, Max Weber is one of the most important public administration thinkers, but we didn't have much time to discuss about what he did and how much he contributed to the development of public administration. So it's my great honor and privilege to have Professor Wolfgang Drexler from Marburg, Germany tonight. My friend Wolfgang was born in Germany, but he was a Virginian for a number of years, having his bachelor degree from Bridgewater College in Virginia and master degree from University of Virginia. And then he uh, went back to Germany and he received his doctoral degree from University of Marburg in Germany. He has quite a long list of his achievement and CV, but I will stop here because of time limitation. Without further delay, please welcome my friend, Professor Wolfgang Drexler. Wolfgang, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Pan. So first of all, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a great honor, pleasure, and privilege to speak this year evening at uh, Yonsei University, one of the most distinguished global, as well as specifically Asian universities, and one where I didn't have the honor so far to give a lecture yet, so this is my first time. At the same time, it is the end of my academic semester here, because you usually end here at the middle of May, and so I, I thank my uh, friend Professor Pan So Kim very much for this very gracious invitation. Let me now share the screen. Um, here it is. And there we go. Everything successful? Everybody can see? Screen works? Yes, we Very can. Yeah. OK, excellent. Yes. So as uh, Professor Pan Kim already mentioned, uh, Max Weber is usually regarded as one of the great thinkers in public administration specifically and in the social sciences generally. in public administration, who came up with that and that concept? Usually the correct answer is Max Weber. And that is why it is particularly interesting to talk to him. Uh, Weber uh, was born in 1864 and died in 1920. This will tell you that he passed away almost exactly 100 years ago. And so we have seen a lot of celebrations of his centennial of the death last year. But this is still in this academic year. And you know how academics are. Many of the conferences and publications are or were delayed, partially because of the pandemic. And so we are right in the time of new information. In fact, uh, Weber passed away as a victim of the last great pandemic, namely of after effects of the Spanish flu. And therefore, there is a direct link here. Uh, the other direct link, if you will, is that, at least arguably, those countries that have a Weberian administration in the wider sense were, as it seems, amongst the most successful resisting or dealing with the pandemic. So you see the relevance, both in theory and in practice, very quickly. The irony was that while Weber died from the last pandemic, this pandemic made almost all the celebrations virtual because during the times uh, that they would have been, there were no international conferences possible. This shows one of them at Heidelberg. Weber's life is not of particular interest. That's why I don't need to talk in this lecture very much about it. As they say, he was born, he lived, he died. 
he was not somebody with a professional appointment. He was an academic all his life, primarily at the universities of Heidelberg and of Munich. He's mostly associated with Heidelberg, but since he died in Munich, many of the celebrations happened there as well. And you see, this is the poster for the lecture series at Heidelberg called In Focus, Max Weber, Interpreter of Modernity, Person and Work. And that gives us a first hint of what makes Weber so important. Weber is a theoretician of modernity. He tries to understand modern life, and that is the life in which we all still live. So Weber doesn't talk about ideal or um, remote areas, histories or futures, but he tries as a social scientist to understand the reality in which we all live. And that is why in the social sciences, we group Weber usually with Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche in that sense that he is on such a high level of a social theoretician to understand reality. Whereas of course, Marx didn't talk about reality in his point and also Nietzsche not, although both are analysts of who is the one who's talking about industry and innovation in a positive sense, basically about democracy in a pessimistic, but yet constructive and real way. This is what he is assuming will happen, not only, but also that, and that is what makes him the great theorist of modernity. In fact, what sociologists and historians call modernization theory, basically go back to Max Weber. The key concept that Weber has in that context of modernization is that of rationalization. That means of a life that is technical and understandable, that is logical, and when A leads to B, that is something you can follow and accept. He paired this with another concept that is really closely associated with him, and that is disenchantment. With disenchantment, he means that traditional ways of belief, of religion, of superstition, of loyalty, and of belonging fade away tendentially in modernity, and that there is a rational living together that needs to be done in a successful way for us to be acceptable. I can say here right away that I am a great fan of Max Weber. I like him and his work, but the, uh, this is one of the aspects in which he has been, I believe, rightly criticized because a disenchantment has happened, but at the same time, as we see also counter movements, religion is not going away and will not be going away, as well as related phenomena. And Weber was a little bit quick in talking about rationalization taking over completely. It happens to be correct as a trajectory. That is the life in which we live, uh, the techno-economic rational world, but not entirely so. Sorry. So um, Weber was not a professor of PA because you couldn't be a professor of PA in that time. He had studied law. He was a professor of economics all the time. All his appointments were professorships of economics. And um, he probably has the greatest reputation today as a social scientist in general, that means as a sociologist, as an overall uh, thinker about uh, uh, human society. But for us in public administration and management, his work in this field is the one that is the most eminent. And in fact, I have said in many publications, and that's not original to me, in public administration, you can um, uh, be for Weber or against him, but you cannot think without him because his categorizations and his ways of how to frame thinking about the public sector is so important. Now, there have been controversies. Of course, if you are that big a man, what that means is if you want your entire life in criticizing Max Weber and writing essays in the various journals and even a bad book or two of why he was wrong. That's what you do. Yeah, if you're not attacked, you're not an eminent thinker. But that discussion is still going on. And we can see also during the anniversary how um, uh, that we are right now in a time when uh, Weber is actually very, very popular again. Not that you have to follow all of his interpretations, but how you conceptualize this, um, especially for the Anglo-American project, 
let me emphasize that there is a big difference between Weberian PA and Weber's PA. That means we use him as a label for a certain kind of public administration, namely what is also called traditional hierarchical bureaucratical administration that he was neither a particularly fan of, nor is this his precise model of bureaucracy. So Weber's model of bureaucracy is uh, very important, one of the most important models in the history of PA thinking. But that, you can say, may be obsolete or not. That is discussable. Whereas Weberian PA as conceptualizing about our world being an administered one basically is a fundamental insight. Since this, as Professor Pansoki mentioned, is also a little bit of a graduate introduction, let me very briefly sum up what uh, Weber's model of bureaucracy actually is, just very, very briefly as a, as a reminder. This actually comes from a very small segment in his last book called Wirtschaft und Gesellschaft, Economy and Society, that was published posthumously and edited by his widow. And it's a very small segment, but the project of bureaucracy was longer. In this one, for Weber, what he posits is that the most efficient and effective public administration has the following characteristic. It is a set of offices in which appointed civil servants operated under the following set of principles. Merit selection, that means you choose somebody not because he's somebody's nephew, but because he's good. Hierarchy, you obey your boss because it's your boss and not because you're convinced. Division of labor. Uh, just as in the economy, exclusive employment. You cannot work in McDonald's at the same time as the Ministry of the Interior. Career advancement, this is the same as one. You get promoted not because you're a nephew, but because you're good. Written form, everything needs to be documented in writing. Uh, legality, that means any bureaucratic act needs to be enabled by the law. And finally, um, and this uh, sums up together, I'm sorry, with the acronym hemmed cloth. This is just these first uh, words put together. That doesn't look particularly weird or exciting or strange, but remember that in the last 19th century, this was not the norm. In the US, almost none of these seven criteria were at the basis of civil service. Already merit selection was impossible in the late 19th century. There was a large group in America that said that, no, we need to select people according to their political reliability and whether they supported our campaign, not because they were competent. This was an open argument, not a form of corruption. This form, Weber says, of rationality his key term, as I told you, would increase speed, scope, predictability, and cost effectiveness as needed for an advanced mass industrial society. These are the pages from the first edition. That means Weber is thinking of what is the optimal form of bureaucracy of that world in which we happen to live and which give and take various elements we still live today. That is why it is still so interesting. And what is important here, I mentioned to you that Weber was both a lawyer and an economist. Weber is one of these thinkers who are always focused on how PA and industry and innovation relate to each other. Yeah, he is not a thinker of a pure public sector for its own sake. We will get back to why this is so important. This is Weber's specific theory of optimal PA. But there is also this other element. Uh, my own philosophical teacher, Hans-Georg Gadamer, the great Heidelberg philosopher who still met Weber, so I'm just one step ahead, has said in one of his philosophical works that bureaucratization is, as Max Weber has shown, the actual fate of our civilization. So the insight that for us in PA is so trivial why do we study PA? Because we want to get a job in the civil service? Because we couldn't get into law school? No, we study PA and we pursue public administration studies because the world in the 20th and 21st century is an administered one. If we walk out to the street, what we see is the effect of administration. This is given in our societies and to point at the primacy in many cases but the importance of the variable of public administration in almost all cases, that is Weber's great merit, the actual fate of our civilization. And here, 
in order to show you what I mean, for the first time, I can make a quick Korean reference. Uh, the knowledge of Korea and Korean culture in Germany, for instance, as you know, was quite weak when I was young and has um, increased to a manifold way in the last one or two decades, mostly via culture. And it started via iconography and via pop music, of course. But today, uh, the German elite perceives Korea primarily through Netflix, through Korean Netflix series, which you do. And if you look at the most popular Korean Netflix series, what do you actually see? My point here is, all of these series show a world in history, in presence, and in heaven and hell that is primarily bureaucratically structured. That means you will have primary features of department heads, of civil service exams, of rules in the Joseon dynasty. How do you become a head bookkeeper? Um, you have all these worlds with a netherworld. You know, look at these, Hotel de Luna or, or Uncanny Counter or something like that. If you go to hell or not, if you can go back and join your parents, it's a bureaucratic job. The, uh, not only this world, but even the next world is bureaucratically structured. And this thinking of reality in bureaucracy that you find in these manifestations of Korean culture is precisely what you see in Weber as well. And it's not trivial, but truly important yeah, that we think of reality as bureaucratically structured. Now, this is not only in the Korean series, but also in reality, not only positive. We know that bureaucracy has upsides and certainly downsides. And Weber was very aware of that. Actually, Weber was not a Weberian. You may know the joke that Luther was not a Lutheran, Marx was not a Marxist, and Weber was not a Weberian. That means that these people did not believe what they stand for. Weber actually didn't like this kind of bureaucracy. He saw that, if anything, like Locke saw the state as a Leviathan, which is what we see here. That means as a necessary evil, as a phenomenon of our time, but one that can go really wrong. In fact, the lock-in into this modern system is very often described by and with Max Weber as an iron cage in which you are and out of which you cannot come. On the other hand, that also means that an as good as possible bureaucracy creates good and happy life today. We cannot think about a system, a life today, in which we can live without bureaucracy. This would be chaos. This would be mass crime. The alternative to bad bureaucracy is to reform the bureaucracy in a positive way, not to cut it or try to eradicate it. This is impossible. So the task must be that of good PA. And that is informing all of us, I think, in, in upper level PA knowledge and in all the main international PA organizations and reform projects in which Professor Pan So Kim has been so active over the decades. This is the goal, to realize that we need public administration and then make it optimal for the life which we are all living. There were counter example, uh, less Weberian PA, but they didn't work. Mm. The great reform movement, the older ones of you will remember it, was called the new public management. The, include, the, the, the overtake of business techniques and economic theory into the public sector. But since it totally misunderstood the role of the public sector, it uh, was a complete catastrophe anywhere. We have almost no examples of new public management being um, effective or efficient. That is one of the great um, experiences of the last 25, 30 years that we have. It was tried often for the best of intentions, but it just didn't work. And uh, um, since 2000, we know that um, I just mentioned here Evans' and Rauch's study of 35 developing countries 20 years ago that show that uh, the prospects of economic growth increase with an increase of Weberian 
bureaucracy. So rather than stopping economic development, it increases it. But since the world has changed since Max Weber, the late Christopher Pollitt and our mutual friend Gerd Bukert came up with the concept of the Neo-Weberian state or NWS that is especially developed in the standard textbook on public management reform with Oxford University Press and about which we will have a conference uh, where Professor Pan and myself will join in London in September, hopefully post-COVID and real, as I mentioned. Now, there was, however, another element where we thought maybe bureaucracy stops, and this is e-governance and the takeover of ICT um, of the public sector. But as we saw, we may have expected digital transformation. That means that the organizations themselves will transfer themselves into a digital version but that didn't happen actually in public administration we have seen almost no digital transformation whatsoever and in fact the success of e-governance and say that consciously as an estonian which is so estonia is so famous for its e-governance advances um, same in singapore same in korea optimal e-governance reforms are done by classical usually weberian bureaucracies there is a direct link you do not have digital transformation of the public sector at all. So back we are to Weber. And in fact, if we look at the hardware of digitality, if you look at your smartphone right now or of your netbook or whatever you're using to watch me, I can almost guarantee you that the firm that made it was at best a Weberian industrial hierarchy and at worst pre-Weberian try to find a smartphone made by anything lateral or networky. These are hard-nosed, top-down hierarchies, all of them. Now, there is another concept to uh, briefly get to, um, and that is that um, I mentioned various concepts that Weber is famous for, value-free science, uh, the ideal type, for instance, various forms of authority. But one of the points that have been particularly discussed today is that Weber makes a very famous distinction between ethics of conscience and ethics of responsibility. Meaning that if you're in public office, both as a politician and as a bureaucrat, you have to fulfill the ethics of responsibility of that office and it is often said that you cannot pursue uh, just what your conscience tells you because you don't have the privilege once you take over the office to follow the luxury of your own conscience and that is an important insight to make but in fact it is the emphasis we should remember and let me make here a very current example for that. Weber does not think you need, uh, you, you can possibly jump over your conscience, but you do need to think the consequences of your actions because of your office along. The example I want to make, and I see we have a participant from there, is the current coup d'etat in Myanmar and the takeover by the junta, which is one of the primary examples of a, not of a civil war and not of a normal military takeover, if you will, but really of a criminal, absolutely ghastly self-interested horde of exploitative cliques taking over a country against the complete will of the people and fighting a set of genocidal war crime sets. And what we see in um, Myanmar right now is a civil disobedience movement in the public sector that is almost unparalleled. That means we see large numbers of civil servants who need to be afraid of their lives quitting or not working for the junta, bringing the country together with other resistance basically to a halt. This is unusual because normally civil servants, when there is a change in government, they just go along. They work for whoever is on top of them. And sometimes it is argued with Weber that, well, once you're a civil servant, it's not your right to judge the government. But Weber would have disagreed with that. As Hannah Arendt has said, nobody has the right to obey. If you are really faced with such an amount of horror, then you don't have an obligation, but it would be metaphysically, if you will, on a very deep level, right to resist 
the criminal takeover. And in fact, people have been tortured to death in Myanmar for resisting the junta. And this is the first uh, victim here. Um, uh, Kotun and Ta or for this. And what uh, Weber would have said here is that that is um, uh, seeing the importance of the public sector uh, for the realization of the state, that is where maybe you cannot demand it, but where it certainly can work and where you can see that kind of delivery as your duty. So Weber is not the person to use as an excuse to work for a criminal government. Now, mm, I mentioned rationalization before. Weber very famously talks about three kinds of authority that you can have for a legitimate state. The traditional one, say a king, the charismatic one, say a leader that is particularly exciting for everybody, and the boring and very usual rational legal authority. That means that um, you exert authority because you do your job based on the laws and fulfilling what you do. But that is, and this is of course what Weber means, both sides. We do expect from the government to rationally, legally deliver. That means both in performance and in ethics. This is what we don't only hope, but this is what citizens require. Charismatic leaders can still take over. There are still places with traditional leaders. And these are ideal types. That means very often you have several of these dimensions. But overall, the expectation and the need to deliver on the rational legal level is certainly there. This is our time. We do have the expectation that in public service delivery, we can rationally process of why the government and why the bureaucrats decided this way and not another, why they implemented this way and not another. If you can't explain it, it's not legitimate and it will erode any form of legitimate governance. Public administration is the state in action. And once the people don't see the public sector in working legitimately anymore. This is the end of the legitimate state just as well. So rational legal is where we are going. In fact, Weber said this rational legal state was the great advantage of the global West, of the global North. That means of that time he described when the West colonially ruled the world, 1750 to 2000 about. And he calls this Occidental rationalism. That means a way of how to order the world that in the end is very successful. Now, um, Sam Huntington, who's from my department at, uh, at Harvard, famously, uh, he's more famous for the clash of civilizations, but one of his famous quotes also is, the West won the world not by the superiority of its ideas or values or religion, but rather by its superiority in applying organized non-Westerners never do. This is a very good, very good phrase for 2020, 2021. But Weber would have disagreed or at least put another step there. Weber would have said the West did win the world by the superiority of its ideas because these rational ideas, not morality, not ethics, not religion, but this rational PA allowed the West to construct an industrial and military edifice that at that point in time was able to run over that area of the world that became the Western colonies. Still, even if Weber talks about it, isn't there a very strong, and we need to ask that in 2021, colonialist element in Weber's writing. Isn't that just a white old man with a beard, a classic German Geheimrat type, talking about the world as such and not about the great centers of power now? Is this applicant to Asia? Well, two dimensions here. First, um, if we want to understand how the world is ticking, Weber is the prince, one of the principal theorists of why it was because we need to explain that, that this factual truth of Western dominance was there, although Weber himself is highly contextual. And he basically talks about this scene. He talks about Berlin 1900. Yeah? That is what he tries to explain. Weber didn't, I always say Weber would have been very surprised 
that we are still discussing his theories that still so much. He would have thought things would have moved on and they haven't. So in a sense, he theorized more than he thought he would. But there is one important element that I want to basically finish as a, um, but it takes a while. So don't think I'm finishing in the next minute or so, but I want to complete my lecture with. And that is that Weber is someone who more than almost anyone else thinks global PA and global comparative PA. And that is why I think he is such a good figure in your lecture series and your program on global PA. Weber tries to explain of why the West won during a time when objectively the West did win, but he doesn't stop there. His claim is global and historical. Weber talks about Egypt and Mesopotamia, but Weber also talks about Islam, Latin American administration, and especially about Asia. And that is why in this lecture, we now need to look a little bit of what Weber said about Asian PA. And in his case, for him, the Asia he looks at is Confucianism or classic Confucianism. Although Weber has a tendency to look only at the Song Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty, and then the times of the Great Wars later. And he has also a tendency to look at mainland China and not the other Confucian countries. First of all, that would be, of course, Vietnam and Korea. Still, Weber and Weber's theory of China are highly complex. But for many decades, Weber was the most non-Chinese cited social scientist about China in China. In um, his most important work called Confucianismus und Taoismus, which I don't even need to translate because it's pretty clear what it means, Confucianism and Taoism. Taoism is just a subchapter. For Weber, Taoism is a, is a little sub thing of Confucianism. He describes this in no detail. Since it was published in the context of sociology of religion, sometimes PA scholars overlook it, but there are large portions in this book that deal with economy and large portions that deal with PA. And it is perhaps the most important analysis of classical imperial Chinese PA and an extension of the other Confucian countries as well, including Joseon Korea, um, that we have. Of course, it's Orientalist, that's not avoidable from a white guy in the late 19th and early 20th century to write about it, but on a level that has been ricocheted back to Asia and back again and back again, that is of great interest, I think it is fair to say. Capitalistically, what China has always complained about is that Weber said it was clear that modern capitalism couldn't arise in China. And that has been really an obsessive remark for Chinese economists. But what Weber actually says is not that capitalism can't exist in China. What he says is capitalism can't start in China. But he says, once capitalism gets to China, the Chinese will be able to do it better than anyone else. And that, of course, is a particularly interesting thing to say in 2021, if you think about it. It's a very smart statement. But we are not here for economics. We are here for PA. And so let's briefly look at what Weber says about Confucian PA. And here we can really use the illustrations from Korea because once again, it's one of the three great Confucian cultures uh, during the Joseon dynasty. That means the Yangban are exactly the same kind of phenomenon, even a higher one than you have in the Chinese elite. You have the same kind of civil service exam, um, the, the mixture of, if you will, a scholarly elite and an artistic elite that is at the same time a bureaucratic one and so on and so on. The scholar is gentleman, if you will. This is one of the ideas that Weber introduced. Um, no, I'm sorry, the scholar as gentleman as bureaucrat. These three together that Weber introduces into PA. Now, um, the in which, as you know, was about the four books of Confucianism, the ranking, the up level, and so on, has often been criticized. But it is Weber who uh, shows that this heavily hierarchical, selective, top-down system, nevertheless, was so flexible and oriented also towards a specific performance uh, goal that 
it did the job it was supposed to do. Weber is the great Western interpreter of the imperial civil service exams and royal civil service exams here in saying of how they worked and why they worked and why especially in a society that has a commercial tendency, I need to have what you see on the right side, the prestige of the public sector so that the best people go into the public sector because this kind of society is not manageable without luring, if you will, the best and brightest into the state service where they precisely not automatically go. If this sounds like the discussion in today's Singapore, that's because that is the discussion of today's Singapore. It's exactly the modern Singaporean um, idea, and if you will, also the modern um, Chinese one. Now, if Weber always thinks the economy along, if you have a heavily hierarchical elite working, but still, if you will, almost princely group of civil servants, how can you make sure that they promote the economy and how they promote uh, even what we would now call innovation? That means performance. And the answer here, very briefly put, I have argued that uh, recently in a journal called Max Weber Studies, which is all about Max Weber in a way too long article, um, uh, Weber's answer here is the mandate of heaven, a much abused concept. But what that means is not only that successful people have the mandate of heaven to perform, namely the emperor, yeah, the, if the emperor is successful, he's a man of heaven, and that's why you can replace the emperor or the king with somebody else if they don't deliver. But as Weber shows, the mandate of heaven pertains to bureaucracies until the lowest department head, not only to the emperor. Everyone needs to perform, and that performance is socially and economically defined. So that means what makes this so hierarchical system, including the Yan Bank, so competitive is that if it's done well and doesn't, you know, if it doesn't calcify, what it means is that it is linked to an extreme performance indicator. That means you need to deliver overall welfare, including economic progress and performance. And that, Weber says, is why this is, in his opinion, the second best system of PA in the world. Guess what he thinks is the best? obviously the one that is named after him. That means specifically the Prussian 19. Even Weber says, if you are not a real insight expert and you're not a PA sociologist, you could be forgiven from looking at classic Confucian PA and Weberian Prussian PA and thinking it was almost the same because they are so similar from the outside that in functionality, they parallelize as well. I think it's really important to look at that legacy as well. Weber was, is very fashion dependent, but he never goes really totally out of fashion. And again, as I said, he is somebody who a hundred years after his death, we still look at um, in details with criticism, overall with great respect. If we were talking privately about London before. Uh, the great architectural monument in London is St. Paul's Cathedral. And if you go in there, it, this was a radical architectural innovation, if you will, at that time. And if you go in there and you look for the tomb of its architecture, uh, of its architect, Sir Christopher Wren, there is no monument, but there is a plaque. And it says, if you're looking for a monument, look around you. Why I say that here is um, Max Weber actually doesn't have a statute. We don't have a Weber monument. We have institutions named after him, uh, schools, uh, programs, awards, but there is no actual, there is also plaques, but there is no Weber monument as such. But in fact, if we are looking for a Weber monument, we just look around us and we see a modern administered world primarily, not always, but mostly. It's the logic of our time. And in that sense, um, we are living in a Weberian world. And in that sense, it makes sense to deal with Weber, both when he talks about the global West and we talks about the East. Thank you so much for your attention. It's already uh, 10 minutes uh, yes. after uh, 7 p.m. in Seoul. So, uh, 
I think we have to finish here. So tonight we have heard and learned a lot about Max Weber or Max Weber, depending upon how you pronounce it, uh, from Professor Wolfgang Drexler. This kind of special lecture series is just the beginning and uh, we look forward to having a lot of a cooperation between Tallinn uh, University of Technology, so-called Taltech and the Yonsei University in the future. Uh, Professor Wolfgang Drexler is teaching in Estonia, but as you heard from him, he's very active in various regions and uh, continents uh, in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and many other uh, countries as well. And today he's staying in Marburg, Germany. And Wolfgang, thank you very much for your uh, rich and a very uh, challenging interpretation, understanding, and uh, you know, uh, questions, uh, etc. Thank you so much for your wonderful lecture and valuable time. And finally, I also like to thank all my colleagues in our Department of Global Public Administration and graduate students, undergraduate students, and uh, graduates like uh, Dr. Pramod. KC from Nepal and others. I'm sure that uh, we can overcome coronavirus crisis with the proper vaccination. I was so sad to learn about Max Weber. He died because of uh, uh, coronavirus in 1920, June 14, 1920. It was so sad. At that time, he didn't have vaccinations. But today we have uh, vaccination. I'm sure we can overcome. And I will take my first shot on May 27. Uh, Wolfgang, did you have shot? Uh, yes, I have. Actually, the first one, and I will have the next one. Uh, Marburg is actually unique because this is the German center of vaccination, and Emil von Bering invented the vaccination here. And so for us, Pfizer BioNTech is actually like a local beer. So it's a very fortunate place to be here because we are also prepared for this, you know? And so I will have tomorrow in a week, my second jab. And from 8th of June, still before Weber's birthday, I will be uh, able to travel without quarantine. Great, great. I will take yes. my first shot on May 27. Once Best again, thank you very much everyone and uh, hope to see you again. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you also bye -bye. from me, everybody and you, professor. Thank you, bye-bye.